Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be talking about my first engineering job as a substation design engineer, specifically what I did, my starting salary, benefits and work schedule, and advice to younger self. Let's get into it. All right, let's talk about my first engineering experience. I accepted a full-time offer with company A as a graduate design engineer. My job description consisted of 14 bullet points, which I listed in the description box below but I consolidated the list into what I think were the top three to focus on to make it in that field. I listed those top three on the screen. They consist of working with the project team, taking personal responsibility, and learned to properly use document management systems. My time at Company A was from 2019 to 2022, to be exact, two years and 10 months. And the bulk of that time was in a rotation program. Well, let's talk about that rotation program. As a graduate engineer, Company A places you in a rotation program that consists of three six-month rotations. The purpose of this is to expose you to some of the different roles you are eligible for as an electrical engineer and to give you a broader understanding of what it takes to successfully build a substation. All this to then give you the opportunity to cast a vote on where in the company you would like to permanently land. With that being said, my first rotation was with the industrials team. The industrials team's primary focus is to serve industrial clients such as Exxon, Marathon, Chevron, and Company A would provide all the high voltage solutions that the client needed. This rotation was interesting and not in a good way. Three months into the job and my supervisor quits. It all made sense why I had little to no work for the first three months. So what did I do to stay busy during my downtime? Last thing I wanted to do was waste my time at my new job as a natural level engineer. It only made sense that I update my Amazon wish list during these first slow months. But seriously, the first real assignment I received was wiring QHX. This is where I would verify that components are wired correct. For example, if drawing A says a wire is connected to on drawing B, I expect drawing B to point back to drawing A. This is how you show connections on paper. Wiring is close to the end of the full PNC protection and controls package. To give you some perspective, let me explain the different stages of the protection and control package. When I say package, I mean the literal drawings that we will physically hand over to the client outlining how everything will be electrically connected. The stages are number one, the relaying one line. Think of the one line as the 10,000 foot view of what the protection will look like. Not sure if this analogy will make sense or not, but another way to think of it, the one line, is a high level map view of Texas. The higher the map view, the less detail there will be. You won't see a street view from this high. Number two, three lines, also known as AC schematics. You build the three lines based on the relaying one line. Think of the three lines as a more detailed one line. Back to the map example, think of now zooming into Houston, Texas. At this level, you will see much more detail. Number three, DC schematics. The one lines and three lines are used to build the DC schematics. Number four, the wiring. The wiring is built directly from the schematics, both AC and DC, and is the most detailed drawing. This would be the ground level street view in the map example. So when I say I did wiring QA, I did point to point checks and verified that the wiring matched the schematics. And it's not as bad as it sounds. Honestly, I kind of enjoyed it. Plus, now that I'm building the whole PNC packages, I can appreciate the detail to make sure we give the client quality work. And the last assignment I received was with the software called CDEX, which is used for ground grid studies. Keep an eye out for a future video on me covering what this is exactly. But let's move on to rotation number two. This one lasted about 16 months, which I know is way more than six months, and I was with the utility team. When I say utility team, I want you to think of utility companies such as AP, Encore, ATC. Utility companies are who homeowners call to get the lights turned on. If we take a look at the image, utilities usually are responsible for the transmission, what's shown in blue, and distribution, what's shown in green, of the electricity that was generated at the generation station, shown in red. What I enjoyed about this rotation is how structured things were. The particular client that we served focused heavily on creating standards that would save time on the detailed work. For example, let's say part of our design calls for a VT, voltage transformer, junction box. Well, rather than building a drawing from scratch, I would reference the standards and select the one that best fits our needs. These same standards would have physical drawings that have all the parts and all the part numbers that are needed. And this saves so much time when creating the bill of materials. Along with this, there will be standard wiring diagrams for the VT junction boxes as well. I would say about 60% of the work is done and the other 40% is taking care of the specifics like wiring designations, drawing number specifics, phase desi designations, pretty much text changes. The downside of having these standards is that it kind of removes most of the thinking involved, which isn't a bad thing if you plan to stay with that company serving 
from that specific client forever. I say this because my experience with the industrials team, rotation number one, was that the clients we were serving did not have standards. In some cases, we had to start drawings from scratch, and after we had a couple of jobs under our belt, we could use older jobs as go-bys. And what's cool about this job or this field is that usually you never start from a blank page. You are given a scope of work and you find standards or a reference job that has similar scope and tailor it to your needs. I'm not sure why I had a hard time grasping that we are not reinventing the wheel at first. The bittersweet I had with this rotation was with my supervisor. He was a bit of a hard ass. He had high, borderline, unreasonable expectations and most of the work he gave me looked like a different language to me at first. But in hindsight, it was kind of a blessing. His high expectations kind of forced me to level up. The first task I received from him was him just dropping documents off on my desk and saying, get to work and let me know when you have questions. I was thinking in my head, does he know that I'm new? Genuinely from the bottom of my heart, I was like, how the hell am I going to finish this? I promise I looked at these documents for like two days before I started. It was the first PNC package that I had to do with three months of experience. Just remember, if you find yourself in this position, just start. <laughs> Rotation number three. My last rotation was a field rotation, which I was super excited for. Not only was there an opportunity for overtime, but you got a company vehicle as well and a gas card. I was at a nearby refinery and I got to see our work go from paper to real life. But the exact job title I had was quality control assistant, which is not an engineering position. But the experience that you gain doing this is very valuable. I remember being in the office and thinking that some details on the drawings are just overkill and unnecessary. Being in the field made me realize that it's all important. For example, I once saw construction placed on hold because of the number of washers that should be used when bolting a piece of steel. The drawing said something different than what was expected. In this particular situation, it was obvious that the drawings were wrong, but the construction crew needs to follow the drawings, or if they don't and something goes wrong, they're liable. So we had this back and forth with engineering for a day on what was correct. And as I mentioned, it turns out the drawings were wrong, but a day could have been saved if engineering had done their due diligence. I got to see firsthand why communication is very important, what the consequences of not meeting deadlines with our client and the rework that has to be done if construction crew didn't follow the drawings. Some of the downsides of this rotation was a start time of 6 a.m. and dealing with poor communication. This is where I learned the lesson to ask questions through email. Another downside was at times, it could get really, really slow for my team. We piggybacked off of construction and there were plenty of variables that would slow them down, such as too much work, not enough people, the weather, and lack of communication. The upside was the experience of all this. Seeing how all the pieces moved, and collaborating with people, and gaining the satisfaction of seeing a project go from start to finish. Let's talk salary and benefits. My starting salary as an entry-level design engineer was 70 k and it only goes up from there through cost of living raises or promotions. You get health insurance, dental, vision, 401k, two weeks of PTO and one week of sick time. And all this starts on the first day of employment. What I was impressed with at first was the half day on Friday. I honestly think that they should have given us the whole day off because the co company also encouraged you to have breakfast with your coworkers and that would take about an hour. So you were only there to work three hours and then call it a day. The schedule we worked was 7.30 to 5.30, Monday through Thursday, and Fridays 7.30 to 11.30 a.m. Why I left. Now, if you noticed, I said I was impressed with the schedule at first. That's because when COVID hit and I found out about remote work, I was one of those people that didn't see a need to go back into the office after that. I valued my time more than anything, and saving 30 minutes one way to go into the office was amazing. So when I did my field rotation, I obviously couldn't work remote, and that was okay. But I reached out to my supervisor and mentioned, boss, when my field rotation is over and I go back into the office, can we discuss a hybrid work schedule? I noticed during COVID that I was able to stay focused for longer periods of time without the distractions of coworkers. Maybe we can do a trial period, and if I don't meet expectations, you can pull me back in. And believe it or not, they said no to that. No counteroffer, no nothing. So my thinking was, based on my performance reviews, I knew that I provided some type of value to the company and that my request wasn't far-fetched. With that being said, I was left with the decision to stay with the company or start looking. Well, I started looking. The search didn't take long. I reached out to a recruiting agency, Actalent. I think I said that right. And they helped me land an interview with my current job that is fully remote. Let me know in the comments below if you want to know what it was like working with a recruiting agency. Bottom line is, 
I wanted to experience what remote work was like, and the company I was with didn't support that. I would like to travel with my family, eventually, and step one for me was to remove the times to traveling to a physical location. Step one, done. Advice to my younger self. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. And if you didn't hear me the first three times, ask questions. I've grown to think of it like this. When you're a new hire and you're starting in this career or any career, you're eligible and encouraged to ask new hire questions. When you have two years under your belt, you want to ask two year questions. When you have three years under your belt, you want to ask three year questions and so on. What you want to avoid is being four years into the same field and asking a one year question. Not sure if this analogy makes sense. I think there is rarely a stupid question, but there are lazy questions. Additionally, don't be scared to ask. For whatever reason, if someone gets smart with you, just kindly let them know that you just started. And if they are unable to help, you can find someone else to ask. CYA. Cover your ass. When it comes to design questions, or questions that alter the direction of your design, ask them via email or IM. We're human, we forget, but paper trails are forever. Justify any decision you make on your design. One thing I try to do is justify all decisions I make towards my design. This gives me the confidence to say, I did this because of X, Y, or Z. It's a win-win situation because A, you will be right in moving forward. You can reference this reasoning in the future. B, you're wrong, and it's very clear to see where in your thinking you were wrong. Thus, an opportunity for learning has prevented, presented itself. Ask questions through email or IM. For me, if I can't write down my question, then I don't know where I'm lost in the process. And it won't be productive for, for me to go to my supervisor and say, I need help. Since I started working remotely, I noticed that I ask more specific questions. What I want to avoid is asking ambiguous questions. Trust me, there are times when I'm looking at something and, and thinking, what the heck is this? But it won't be productive to lead with that. Asking via email or IM has really helped me dial in on the area that is confusing. Plus, using things like SNP tool or sending PDFs with comments on exact areas that are, are losing you are invaluable. If you are 100% lost on something, just start. Do what you think it is that you're supposed to do. Once you have progress, check in with your lead or supervisor. You are either clearly wrong or clearly right. And I don't see either as a positive or negative. I'm just trying to deliver a quality deliverable to the customer. All right, friends, we just talked about what I did, starting salary and benefits, advice to my younger self, and overall covered my first engineering job. If you have any explanation re requests on anything related to substations, leave them in the comment section below. I want to help you with your first years in substation design. Also, check this video out here if you want to see how a disconnect switch works. Thanks.